You all know we have this plan to, to make it through the Bible, and I have my sermons planned out months in advance. And I knew as part of this trip, one of the things that would be transformative for us would be to see things from both the Israeli and Palestinian side. So I knew I would need to preach on Israel and Palestine. And then things sort of blow up over there. Um, So it's more important than ever that we talk about this, but also that we have some humility about it um, as they struggle yet again to find a way. I'm also going to share with you that we know a lot of the Israeli perspective. We know less of the Palestinian perspective. And that was what was transformative for the people on the trip was understanding and seeing the reality of life in Palestine. So today's sermon will seem to favor the Palestinian perspective. It is simply that that was for us the most dramatic encounter. I don't think we are meant to pick sides in this story, in part because it's not our story, but also because these are all beloved children of God. So I invite you to have an open heart as we approach this topic today. And as I read from Leviticus, um, chapter 35, verses 35 to 43. If one of your fellow Israelites faces financial difficulty and is in a shaky situation with you, you must assist them as you would an immigrant or foreign guest so that they can survive among you. Do not take interest from them or any kind of profit from interest, but fear your God so that your fellow Israelite can survive among you. Do not lend a poor Israelite money with interest or lend food at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt to give you Canaan's land and to be your God. If one of your fellow Israelites faces financial difficulty with you and sells themselves to you, you must not make him work as a slave. Instead, they will be like a hired laborer or foreign guest to you. They will work for you until the Jubilee year, at which point the poor Israelite along with their children will be released from you. They can return to their extended family and to their family property. You must do this because these people are my servants. I brought them out of Egypt's land. They must not be sold as slaves. You will not harshly rule over them, but must fear your God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes that we might see and know the word you have for us this day. In your holy name we pray. Amen. One thing that really interested me this trip was to see firsthand on the ground the Israel-Palestine relationship. Um, That is one that's a difficult topic for me, which means that I'm more inclined to wrestle with it. On one hand, I believe that the Palestinian people absolutely have a right to to, to have a homeland. Um, We spent two days two plus days, I guess, traveling around Palestine and um, saw firsthand some of the oppression. Um, We saw in Bethlehem a refugee camp where um, the people who lived there were displaced when Israel became a state in 1948. Their homes were stripped away from them and um, because of that they've they've essentially been um, protesting in place, almost a live-in, I guess is a good way to to describe it, by staying in this camp. I wasn't alive during the Berlin Wall separating East and West Berlin, but it felt very Berlin Wall-esque with um, the graffiti and um, very much a difference between the two sides of the wall where um, one, one people lives in much more freedom. I thought that it was striking when our guide 
informed us that people can enter Palestine freely, but then to go back from Palestine into Israel um, takes a lot of effort. Um, you have to go through checkpoints. Soldiers search pretty rigorously. In, in fact, as we re-entered Israel, uh, it was quick, but a soldier, an Israeli soldier boarded our bus, and um, we had to show that we were Americans. We had to show our American passports, and they do that because they don't want Palestinians entering Israel. Mm -hmm. um, the Palestinians are very much an oppressed people group. Any perspective has a bias to mm -hmm. it. Um, but yes, I think one of the things that is that was valuable to me the first time I came has been valuable again this time is is seeing is getting that story weighted out a little bit better so yes. that you can see both it's an incredibly complicated issue and you understand the the Jewish people need a place yes, as well yes. um, that's why it's not easy because right. because Israel has a legitimate claim to statehood it's not as if we would just re just remove Israel from the equation right. and replace them with Palestine because Israel has has a right to to their own statehood. The, this is the Jewish homeland and homeland right. and they have a right to that. Right. It's a hard issue because there's no solution that would satisfy. I was really wanting a, a fuller perspective on the political situation that was going on of always thought that Israel, you know, the Jewish people have gotten a raw deal for millennia. Mm -hmm. They tried to make a solution, but that solution was at the expense of the Palestinians. Um, so it was good to hear the other side of it. We hear so much of the Israeli perspective. And I just know that it's something that requires a lot of prayer and a lot of work because there has to be a resolution the fact that the three churches can be built on top of the nativity mm -hmm. um, says so we can work things out. Yeah. And I'm hopeful that at some point we do that. So that last bit of the video, I hope you could tell that you can hear the Muslim call to prayer and the bells ringing at the Church of the Nativity at the same time. And, um, and Julia talks about that particular church. That's when she said the three churches that are working together. The Church of the Nativity is actually has a Roman Catholic church, an Arminian Apostolic church, and a Greek Orthodox church all within it. And they have agreements as to when each one will worship and who gets to process when and what bells are rung. They even have... Christmas worked out. Roman Catholic Christmas happens the 25th of December. The Greek Orthodox Christmas happens on Epiphany. And then the Arminian Christmas happens around January 20th, which is why it was still decorated for Christmas. When we were there, it was still Christmas, which is amazing, by the way, to be in Bethlehem during Christmas. Um, so, but that, that moment where you hear the Muslim call to prayer and the bells ringing, plus the three churches all in one, just is one example of how the faiths all layer on top of themselves in this space. There were a couple of other places that it was striking for me. One is when we went to the upper room, and our, we, we were kind of pressed for time, so our guy didn't have a lot of time to talk about it. Um, but the upper room, one of the reasons that it has been designated to that is because it is on top of David's tomb. So you have David's purported tomb, and then on top of that you have the upper room. So it's, it's dear to Judaism, it's dear to Christianity. And then because Jesus is important in Islam, he is a great prophet in Islam, for a while the upper room has been controlled by Muslims. And so there is actually a cutout in the upper room um, directing uh, the, the area, the, the, the turn toward Mecca. So when... Muslims are in that place. They know which direction to turn to to pray. And there is even a, a gift of a pope in there that is a tree with three branches. And it is to represent the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all represented there. And then 
the the opening picture where the title was and then one of the early pictures in the video, you may have saw that, that golden domed building. That is the Dome of the Rock, which is on top of the Temple Mount. And the Temple Mount is a beloved space, um, especially for Judaism and Islam. Um, it is... It is where the first and second temple were, was built, and it was in part built there because that is supposedly that rock that's under the Dome of the Rock is where Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac. So it is a very holy space. In fact, it is perhaps the holiest space and site in all of Judaism. Uh, but it is also where Muhammad landed on that rock as he descended from heaven on a winged horse which makes it one of the three holiest sites in Islam. And by the way, our, our guide, when he was explaining this to us, said, yes, he landed on the same rock. He couldn't land one meter over. Like one meter over would have been very helpful. <laughs> um, and there have been a number of agreements that have come about regarding the Temple Mount. One of them key... Uh, a key result of the Six Days War in the 1960s um, in which agreements were made that the, the Dome of the Rock would remain Muslim and on up there on the Temple Mount only Muslims can pray. Jews have the Wailing Wall, which is right down from it, and they pray there, but only Muslims can pray up on the Temple Mount, um, and that is a Muslim mosque and no other worship to take place there. Jordan actually controls the Temple Mount. Israel provides the security. It's in it, well, it's in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is a tricky town because part of it is Palestinian and part of it is Israeli. Um, and both Israel and Palestine would like to claim Jerusalem as their capital. Neither is allowed to right now because of the contested reality. Now, some of you may have noticed in the news, I mean, we I just told you last week how safe we felt, how at peace everything was, and since then, since we got back, things have erupted. And we, when we look at what the source of the recent tensions are, well, was it the Israeli politician who went up on the Temple Mount? He did not pray there, but it was like pushing up against those restrictions, like he, he might pray there. Well, that raised some anxiety among the Palestinians and may have started some plotting, some preparation for in case things happen, which then caused Israel to raid a refugee camp in which civilians were killed, which then inspired a Palestinian to open fire on a synagogue and some other areas in Jerusalem, right there at the Mount of Olives where we all were. It took place there. And as of this morning, we got news that Israel's response is going to be to arm its citizens. I would love for them to have some conversation with us about how that works. So then the question becomes, who is at fault? Well, how far do you want to go back? Do you want to just look at these recent events? Do you want to look at the events a couple of years ago that led to that politician's election? Or when a 13-year-old Palestinian was killed in another raid? Do you want to go back to the formation of Hamas or of the PLO? Do you want to go back to the Six Days War? Do you want to go to the UN? Do you want to go to Hitler and blame, blame Hitler for what happened to the Jews? Do you want to go to the British occupation after Ottoman rule? Do you want to go to the Crusades? Or do you want to go back to the Bible? in which God promises the people, the Hebrew people, a land that the Canaanites already live on. Who is right? Who is right? There's no clear answer. But in this moment, as I said, I'm going to share a little bit about what we experienced in Palestine. Because Bethlehem is in Palestine, that surprises a lot of people. Um, part of Jerusalem is considered Palestinian. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit of what we experienced in Bethlehem and the West Bank. 
you saw the wall. It is monstrous, y'all. It's monstrous. Um, and stretches the entire run of, it, of the West Bank. Um, you heard about the checkpoints that we went through. There are also vehicle limitations. Depending on your um, vehicle license tag, you have certain amounts of mobility. And some of those vehicles are not allowed to cross over into Israel, as Wesley mentioned. Which means that if you are a Palestinian who works in Israel, which a fair number of them do, they have to leave their car <laughs> and find another way to navigate getting to work at the checkpoints. Um, Wesley also mentioned a little bit the refugee camps. So if you're un, unfamiliar with the refugee camps, these were camps that were set up when um, Israel is made into a state. Um, Jewish people were allowed to go to the homes of Palestinians and seize them. And the Palestinians had to leave. They have held on to their keys. Um in hopes that one day they will get to go back to their home. But in the meantime, are living in stacked housing that is little more than slums. And, you know, when I, when I talk about this with, with Americans, a lot of times the, the reaction is, well, why don't they just get over it? Why don't they just get over? It's been decades now. Like the people that are living in the refugee camps haven't even ever lived in those houses. Why don't they get over it? To which I want to say, first of all, would you get over it? <laughs> would you get over it if someone showed up at your house and said, this is my house now, leave? But also I want to say, really, Americans, the land of the Hatfields and the McCoys, the land of the North and the South, the land of the Republicans and the Democrats, what makes us think we would get over it? And in the midst of this, in this allotment of land that they have been given, there are also 700,000 Israelis living in settlements in Palestine. They have just built new housing over there. It's illegal. The UN has restricted it, and they are living there anyway. And I think sometimes we also wonder, what's the big deal about this land? Well, part of it is actually we saw the difference coming from the, the wilderness. Wilderness, for us, we think forests. Just think the most barren desert scrubland that's hill after hill after hill after hill. You come out of that and you land in the Jordan River Valley and it is really the land of milk and honey. Y'all, we saw dates. We saw bananas. We saw all this lush farmland. And agriculture, it's an amazing break after this really hard wilderness. It's also a kind of key bridge of land between Africa and Europe. But it also has so much religious significance to everyone, to everyone. And we saw also as we were there the impact on the land by the absence of infrastructure. There is trash everywhere, all over Palestine, because they don't have the infrastructure in place to take care of it. And there are giant jugs on the roofs of the Palestinian houses. And our somebody asked about them, and our driver said, oh, it is so exciting, we will never run out of water. What he did not say was what I learned the previous time I went there. The reason that they store water is because if tensions start to rise or if water gets scarce, Israel cuts the water to Palestine because they control the flow of water. So the Palestinians store water to be able to survive those moments. And in the midst of this, that, that this battle often gets portrayed as Jewish versus Muslim. It is much more complicated than that. But in the midst of this, there are Christians that live there. And they are the first Christians, y'all. Um, my previous guide said the, thing, the question he gets the most irritated about being asked is, um, when did your family convert to Christianity? And he, he says, when, I'm, when I was feeling especially sharp, I would say, at the shepherds? <laughs> when did you convert? Because we converted the world. When did you convert? 
We were the first Christians. The first Christians are now down to, they, prior to the pandemic, there were 47,000 Christians living in Palestine. Post-pandemic, because they did not have the infrastructure in place to navigate the shutdown of tourism, so many of them left. Um, they're down to 30,000 Christians. That's less than the population of Bentonville. It's just so hard. And it seems like an unsolvable problem, but I also want to say, really? Don't we all worship God? Isn't God miraculous? Now, I will admit that Scripture is a hurdle. The passage that I read today talks about, I promised you, this land of Canaan. It admits the complicated reality of, okay, Hebrew people, you're going to go live here where there's already people. (laughs) And I promised you this. And even within this passage, there seems to be some privileging of the Hebrew people within it. But I also want us to, to hear in this part of Scripture the part that I think draws this whole thing into question, which is you are to treat them as you would treat a foreign guest among you. You are to treat them as you would treat an immigrant. God, throughout the biblical narrative, has said, You will treat the stranger well. You will take care of the stranger, the orphan, the widow, the immigrant. You will take care of the vulnerable among you. You will not do damage to one another. Yes, you need a home. Yes, you need a place. But so do others. So I think that in the midst of Scripture being part of the problem, let's just acknowledge that. It's part of the problem. It is also the source of the solution of paying attention and making space. Making space for each other amidst difference. Taking care of those who have need and seeking everyone's freedom and liberation from slavery. And I think also that inclusion of people points to the other solution, which is the people. One of the things that our guard or or that our guide said was, he said, you know, honestly, 80% of all the people want to live together in peace. 80% of us want to find a way to be together. It's the 20% that's holding us captive. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Does it sound like our political system? Does it sound like our church? In the midst of the division, if you ask United Methodists, 80% of us want to find a way to live together. 20% want to divide. What is it about that 80-20 split? You know, there's a movie coming out called 80 for Brady, right? about those 80-year-olds that went to find uh, Tom Brady. I think we need need an 80 for love and peace, an 80 for living together, an 80 for making space for one another. I want to share the story of our journey on the Temple Mount. So the first time I went to Israel, I didn't get to go to the Temple Mount. I didn't get to go, Um, in part because... Tensions were too high. Um, But we got to go this time, and this is the same day that we had the person get injured, right? So our guide has left, gone to the hospital. He's had us go back to the Wailing Wall. We have to get on the Temple Mount before 1030. At 1030, they shut it down for Muslim prayer. He comes running back to us at 1025, yells for us to come with him to go in the entrance, which we have to clear security and all of that. He says, I talked to the guards. They're going to let us in. Okay. And he's just yelling and talking through the guards the whole time while we're getting in really when we shouldn't be. 
And he said, we're just going to have to keep walking. We're going to have to keep walking really fast. So just keep walking. We had headsets. He's talking to us, giving the history of the Temple Mount while we're on a mission, right? And, and he is also convinced we're going to get to the gate on the other side of the Temple Mount because it will save us some walking. Um, and he's having to yell at guards the whole way. No, we're going. We're going. We're going. Just get us. We're getting to the beautiful gate. We're just going. We're going. We're going. Right? And, and we're like, okay, we're just whatever. We're, <laughs> and then about that, we're about halfway across the journey, and Andrew Barrington's with us. Now, y'all, an Olympic athlete would have had trouble with this stepping that we're doing. Andy starts to lose her breath and said, I can't go any further. And I said to Joseph, our God, Andy, Andy's having trouble. And he goes, okay, Angie, sit down. And I thought, well, Angie, it was nice knowing you. <laughs> so Angie and Kevin, her husband, sit down, and he's like, Pastor, keep moving. And so we just keep going, and we get to the gate, and he goes, okay, I have to go back and get Angie. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And a few minutes later, he and Kevin run back. And I see them both, and I'm like, oh, we really did lose Angie. (laughs) And then Angie comes flying by on a golf cart with a guard and says, the only way to travel. (laughs) There were rules. You cannot be up there when Muslim prayer is going on. You cannot be there. And yet in the midst of somebody struggling and having a hard time, Exceptions were made. And people worked together to get her to a safe space and us to a safe space and where we needed to be. And I think that's ultimately what people want to do. I think ultimately all it is is to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that's what we really want. And it is what all three faiths have in common. All of them. It's really that simple, and it's really that difficult. So with that in mind, I don't, I mean, I I gave an answer. Let's love one another. But in light of how hard that is, I want us to close out. I'm not going to pray. We're just going to have a moment of silence for all the hurt that's going on in Jerusalem and Palestine and Memphis, everywhere. Let's go to the Lord and ask for God's peace. Lord, in your holy, holy name we pray. Amen.